see, I'm 28 and I live in Paris. Paris is not really a big city, you know, it's like three, four million people, no big deal. But the trouble is that every, every day when I go to work, I still actually experience this. So if you can find me on that picture, please tell me, because I'm buried somewhere in the middle of these people. The trouble is that this is today in 2013. Try to imagine in 2050 with twice as many people living in cities, twice as many. Where are we gonna put them? I mean, you know, from what I know, there are not more trains in Paris. Like that's it, we've reached capacity. So when you look at it this way, what happens is that you realize cities at some point just don't scale. They just don't scale. And like everything that doesn't scale, eventually it fails. But do we really want city to fail? I mean, think about it. Five million people living in a city that doesn't work? That's a social catastrophe. Fortunately, there are some solutions. And we believe these solutions will come from better management of how we actually you know, use our cities. And one way of doing it is to basically predict what's gonna happen, right? You know, if you can predict, you can prevent. This is a project we've been doing with the French National Railway, SNCF. It's a huge project in the Paris region public transport. What we're doing is predicting how many people will be on board trains in the public transport system. But because it's predictive, I can actually be at my office at 3 p.m. and check out trains at 5 p.m. when I want to go home. And obviously, I'm going to not take the red one because that means I'm going to be like squeezed in. I'm going to take the one just before that's green. Green means I can sit. So think about it. From a user perspective, for the first time, I can actually know in advance how comfortable I will be and make an informed decision so that I can be comfortable and have a better quality in the public transport system. But what's even nicer is that with enough people, what happens is that you have a diffusion of the load across more trains. So this is very important. If you're into public transport, you know that peak hours is a nightmare, right? Because you've got everybody in the same couple of trains and you know, more people on trains means more people are trying to rush through the doors. That means trains are delayed and it's a mess. If you're diffusing it across more trains, you're making the entire thing more efficient and more comfortable for the people. So how do we do it? Well, you know, many people will be doing something called extrapolation. So I'm gonna look at the past historical data and say, huh, you know, an hour ago this train was full, therefore the next train should be full, or like maybe it's a Tuesday and Tuesdays are full. But what happens if you have a concert of Lady Gaga? Or, you know, if you have a snowstorm, or worse, if you have a snowstorm and a concert of Lady Gaga? You know, I mean, you know, we're laughing, but the point is, when this happens, most people commuting actually end up having a lot of trouble commuting. And this is wrong, because we believe that there is no solution. In fact, there is. And what we call it is contextual modeling. So instead of just using a historical data, we're gonna be looking at the reasons why this happened in the past. So we're modeling the underlying factors instead of just looking at historical data. And if there is one thing that finance taught us is that just looking at the past and thinking it's gonna work in the future, it doesn't work. So this is why you need to understand the factors. So how did we do it for our public transport? Well, it's actually quite simple. We looked at things such as unemployment rates and the station served by the transport system. We looked at how many people were living there. Is it a residential area? How many offices are in there? You know, how many people are actually between 15 and 25? And when you put all of this together, then you're able to understand the context and therefore predict the future even if you never observed it in the past. The cool thing about this kind of approach is that you can use it for many other things. So this is a project that we're currently doing internally. So this is not with a partner, this is like internal research on predicting crime in New York. We use things such as, is there a street light that's off? You know, it's darker, therefore it's easier to actually, you know, uh, go at someone. Uh, we looked at things such as, is this area rich? Does, does, it, does, it, does it become richer? Other thing we looked at is parking. You know, big pain, everybody knows that. I'm in my car looking for a place to park. And some people are building, you know, smart sensors, and that's amazing, that's very important. But what about all of the cities that cannot afford them? What we're offering here is a way for people to know in advance how likely they are to find a parking spot. Red, no way. Green, you can find a place. This was early in New York, so don't think this happens very often, unfortunately, right? And finally, we can even use it to predict energy. How much energy does a building consume, right? So this is a very important question because you can know in advance what's the energy profile of a building, well, you can bring it the energy it needs. When you put all of this together, you get something really cool. You get an actual like meta model of how a city works. You have an actual understanding of how all these different things uh, affect each other. 
So you can start really managing your city in a very smart and predictive way. You can start planning garbage collection routes based on traffic predictions. You can start routing energy based on how much people are going to need it. And what you end up with in the end is a very efficient city that actually scales more than what we can do today. It's not going to solve all problems, but at least it's going to help us get a little bit further with what we currently have. So this is what we call algorithmic urbanism, right? It's not like something that's science fiction. This is something that we can do today. It's just a matter of getting access to the right data. And when I talk data, I don't talk like some kind of aggregated study. I talk like raw, big, big data, right? Big data, that kind of data. You know, we're talking multi-petabytes of data, that kind of thing that gets me excited, right? Can you see that? Right, yeah, yeah. But unfortunately, it's not very easy because most of the time when you get access to data, it's really bad quality data. It's not because people don't want to give you good data. It's just because it's not always there. And you know, as we know, garbage in, garbage out. So we need to get really, really amazing data. And Rio de Janeiro with the control center is actually really doing something amazing when you think about it. They're putting all of that data together in one place, in one format. I mean, if everybody, if everybody does that and gives people access to this data, can you imagine, you know, can you imagine having like everyone like us doing you know, the same thing? That would be amazing, right? So for these reasons, we actually created a new initiative that's called Free Data. The idea here is not to just open data. This is great, this has been done, and it's working fine. We're talking about data that cannot be opened, you know, data that's too sensitive or too commercially viable. You know, we still need to be able to work with this data. So what we created is a public platform where anyone can basically declare what data they're holding and say, look guys, I've got this data set. If you have an idea, just say it and come to me and let's do a partnership and actually let's build a solution to our problem. So, you know, when I think about it, sometimes I feel that maybe I'm young, you know, I'm naive and this is all I dream and that's cool hippie kind of stuff. But actually, I don't see why we shouldn't do it. You know, we're, it's possible. This is possible today. And as a citizen of a city, I don't want to be in a city where every day I feel constrained by what's happening. You know, I want to be in a city that actually learns and adapts from what I'm doing and actually gives me a good quality of life. Thank you.